I'll be doing this till the day I die. And I hope not. I hope I don't have to spend my days, you know, going to save dogs. And you know you can't save them all. And then you ride by barns and you look and you wonder, there's there dogs in there? The sad thing is, it's illegal. They're allowed to do this to these dogs. I mean, six, seven years, you know, they've been locked up in the cage outside. You see no protection from the weather, the heat, you know, the cold air, the rain, the snow, the thunder, nothing. They have no protection. But yet, as soon as we take the dog and you, it just wants to kiss you. And it just, you know, wants the affection. Look, look at you. Look. Look, it's okay. It's all right, look. Come here. You're okay. All right. Mom and Dad will probably live their entire lives on that facility in a pen, whether it's small or, or a larger size, but they're not themselves pets. They are breeding stock. They, they typically don't come in the house and snuggle on the couch. They have no idea what life as a pet is about because they spend 24-7 in a cage. When you came into one of these puppy mills, you would just see one on top of another in these little chicken wire crates. You know how cramped it is when you're, when you're flying. And I was thinking about it and I thought, it must be like that for the puppy mill dogs that are in these cages, not being able to get up or move around. And I think that the, the 747s accommodate 400 people. And I thought, it's just like taking 400 golden retrievers or labs or shepherds and putting them in a seat, strapping them in, and making them live there for eight years. You will typically smell the facility before you actually walk near the cages. And as soon as you can see the cages, <clears throat> I know it's going to be a bad situation when you have the above ground wire bottom cages because that sort of tells us that the person is trying to be very efficient. This is a business. People are in it for profit. For an initial outlay of a couple hundred bucks for a few breeding pairs, you can be selling puppies for $1,000 or more a piece. Um, if you breed at every heat cycle, which is not what you're supposed to do, but which many puppy millers do, uh, you could be making tens of thousands of dollars within a couple of years. They were housed in chicken coops. In fact, one dog broker said there's probably more dogs in chicken coops nowadays than there are chickens. They make money on dogs being born. They rarely see a vet. Um, the vets are expensive, can be expensive, and that would cut into their profits as far as selling the dogs. Um, it's not good. It's really not, not a good place for a dog to be. It was a night that I was 
on the internet and somehow something came over me and said I want another puppy so I googled uh, puppies buying puppies online the delivery person called me to set up a day and time or what time the dog would be arriving and he said you know I would like cash upon arrival not a check and that was fine so he went first wanted me to meet him at a rest stop on the New Jersey Turnpike I just cut him off right there. Like that was not, I'm not gonna end up on Dateline. Like this is not happening. I know, I know some things aren't right. And that was one of them. I'm not a nervous person. I'm not scared of many things, but I was nervous because my children were inside. And this guy was delivering a puppy at 11 o'clock at night in a van that reeked of cigarette smoke. I said, this is the street my house is on. I didn't want him to have my real address. So he said, that's fine, I'll call you when I'm on the street. He was supposed to arrive around eight o'clock. He called and said he was running late and he showed up at 11. So it, it was very fast. He called when he was out front. I ran outside down the street and he got opened his, it was a van. He opened his van and there was all crates of dogs, puppies in the back. And he picked out Rufus and he said, here's your dog. Two pieces of paper came with the dog that they looked like I could have printed off the computer. But that's, I didn't know any better. So I just assumed it was fine. I brought the dog in and it was late. So I just put him, I played with him for a little bit, but he was super tired and he just looked like he wanted to go to sleep. So I put his bed in his crate and he didn't cry, which was weird because when I had puppies before, they cried in their crate the first time. He didn't make a sound. I was like, this is the best dog ever. He doesn't even make noises. It's a perfect baby. And um, I woke up to a dog that was basically having seizures, going to the bathroom and throwing up. I thought he was gonna die. And it, that, like, I, you know, it was, it's only 24 hours, but you bond and as a person, you just feel super bad. For, it's a baby and you just wanna help it. He starts making this horrific sound like he's yelping in pain out of nowhere, like just laying down, just making this terrible sound off and on. And I said, this isn't normal. And then he threw up and had diarrhea. And I said, I'm gonna take him to our family vet. I'm thinking that I can't believe that somebody would send this dog here that's sick and this is all the money that we're gonna spend and this is crazy because I had no idea what to expect because they said they could stay there for days to get better and I was just, I was worried about the money, I was worried about the dog at the same time. After spending two days at North Star Pets being treated for hypoglycemia, Rufus was able to return home. At the initial examination, the veterinarian that cared for Rufus certified he was unfit for purchase. Rufus's cross-country journey began in Millersburg, Ohio, on a farm owned by Mose Troyer. This is how naive I am after I buy the dog, after he's delivered, then I start Googling Moose Troyer. Then is when I start. And then I was like, what is wrong with you? Why wouldn't you... I really, that's how naive I was that I thought it was going to be perfect. And then, then I start Googling and my hindsight was like, I need to find out where these parents are. Like, I was disgusted. Less than two weeks before Nicole purchased Rufus online, Troyer's USDA license was canceled. Currently, no USDA or state commercial license is issued for this address. I felt like giving up a couple of times. I said, no one's calling me back. This is so frustrating. But then I kept thinking it wasn't about the money. It was the fact that this was a life that no one cared about. They were just like, oh, take the puppy that was six weeks old, five weeks old away from its mom and just shove it in a van with Creepster and then call it a day like no one cared. Off State Highway 53 in the middle of Ohio, this is a puppy mill not unlike the one that Rufus was likely born in. It's where his parents will remain until they're unable to produce the puppies and profits expected by the owner. There's no natural light, no human contact, except for the red pickup that stops by once a day to scatter food and fill water bowls, unregulated and under the radar. Often we find that on the East Coast that many of the puppies are coming from um, what we call ground zero for large-scale volume breeding, puppy mill breeding, and that's Holmes County. And it is really the heartbeat of where a lot of the puppy mills and a lot of the issues have started in the state of Ohio. When you consider that they have 43,000 population and you have over 500 kennels, 
That's a lot of kennels for the number of people in that general area. In Holmes County alone, in 2007, 2008, it was a $9 million business. Now, when you consider that the average um, family income for a family of four is probably less than $30,000 in Holmes County, that's a considerable amount of um, production that is coming out of that particular area in Amish country. Rufus's journey to New Jersey is similar to the one thousands of puppies travel from Holmes County, Ohio. In the years since Rufus arrived at Nicole's house, the driver has made multiple journeys to the East Coast, delivering puppies sold on the internet from puppy mills throughout Holmes County. There's times where we hear where the puppy was actually transported by someone um, just like John Public, and they load him into a vehicle and so when the puppies arrive, it's not unusual to have a vehicle full of puppies and some of those puppies are very sick and some won't make the trip whatsoever. I just assumed banned puppy mills places, they always meant like the mall, the puppy store in the mall or the puppy store on the side of the street. I just never thought that it was like on the internet. I really thought when I bought Rufus that he was in Pennsylvania running through a field, happy, and I didn't think it was a puppy mill dog at all. Pennsylvania farmers began breeding dogs probably about 30 or so years ago. There were actually breeders in Missouri who came up to Pennsylvania specifically because of its large Amish and Mennonite farming communities here. We had one of the worst states for puppy mills and we were called the puppy mill capital of the east and that was primarily because Pennsylvania's number one industry is agriculture. The Amish and the Mennonites are, are more likely to view these animals as cash crops, uh, as agricultural products. We've heard that over and over again, and I believe that to be true. Not all Amish families and not all Mennonite families breed dogs, uh, but the large majority, the overwhelming majority of the people that we deal with, the breeders, are Amish or Mennonite. It was something that farm families could do between when you harvest in the fall and when you plant in the spring. As commercial kennels cropped up across Pennsylvania in the late 1960s, the welfare of the dogs trapped in puppy mills was not viewed as a priority of the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Inspections were few and far between. The regulations were ill-defined, and the program was clearly underfunded. So the regulators were completely tied by the laws and just the, the vagueness of all of them. So what we really needed was enforceable, measurable standards. You would see inspection reports time and time again where uh, a warden is warning a breeder to do something. And this didn't go on for like one or two inspections in a year's time. You're talking about years and years of warnings for, for many of the same offenses. There was so much opposition from within the industry itself that the regulations were just going nowhere, and it became very apparent that we had to do a legislative fix. Throughout the years, efforts to improve the lives of dogs in Pennsylvania puppy mills would ultimately die in the legislature at the hands of powerful lawmakers. It was not until a simple billboard was put up in Lancaster County that the general public began to learn of the problem. Our first billboard, we made it look like a postcard, and we had a family in a car, and they were all waving, and across the top in yellow script, just like a postcard, it said, welcome to scenic Lancaster County, home to hundreds of puppy mills. And we received over 3,000 phone calls and emails in two days. And the majority of those phone calls came from people who lived in Lancaster County who were thanked us for finally doing something about what their neighbors were doing. I think the issue gained a lot of um, traction through the media, you know, more reporting on the issue. It became sort of something that was, that was out front. It was no longer confined to, you know, what, what happened behind the barn doors. After witnessing the overwhelming response to their billboards in Pennsylvania, Mainline Animal Rescue placed a new billboard, this time near Oprah Winfrey's studio in Chicago. When we were on Oprah, and uh, the aftermath. Um, we watched it up here in the kennel. I realized that it really didn't matter 
what the legislators wanted or what they didn't want because people started contacting us. And people were horrified, horrified by what was happening in Lancaster County, what was happening in Pennsylvania, what was happening in Missouri and Oklahoma and Nebraska. And they couldn't believe that animals were being treated this way and they wanted to do something about it. This was 100% a public effort. It was really because people were hearing about the plight of puppy mills on the news, on Oprah, uh, reading about it in their newspapers, going home and looking at the faces of these little pooches that are sharing their you know, tables and beds <laughs> for most of us, and saying, oh my gosh, what if that had been my dog? And it became very, very personal to a huge number of people who started picking up the phones and calling their legislators. Through this whole struggle, and it was a struggle, and it was hard, it was very, very difficult, I never lost sight of the fact that the people have the power to change things. And when the legislature realized that they did not want to go home in an election cycle and face the constituency wondering, why didn't you do something about this, the bill got legs. Uh, this was a two year long, easily two to three year long legislative battle in, in Pennsylvania. Many of the dogs that the law was, was pushed through, many of the, law, the dogs that we wanted to protect are now dead. So I'm hoping that it's the, the dogs, future dogs, the dogs that are in these places in the future are helped by what we've done. But most of the dogs, the majority of the dogs that we wanted to help are gone now. And they never got the relief that they deserved or that the law afforded. I'm a union boilermaker out of Pittsburgh. Just about every free time I, I have is basically either I'm working and I'm working a 10-hour shift. I'm working on or I'm saving dogs. Because everybody has their own little parts. And I think that was that was my calling to, you know, go into the mills and that's what I wanted to do and get the dogs. So I know there are a lot of times they're covered in urine, they're covered in crap, and they got fleas. What I like to do is take them and then hold them and pet them, because they've never been touched. You know, kiss them. I mean, I don't mind they got pee all over them. Because I want to separate that we're different. You know, you're leaving that life. And I want their, you know, the rehab to start as soon as we take the dogs. And it's sad because you can't save them all. So it hurts. I mean, there's plenty of nights. You stay up at night and you can't sleep. I think a lot of rescues that, you know, deal with the puppy mill dogs know that. I mean, you lose sleep. You know, it's constantly running through your mind about the dogs you left behind. Like the one uh, puppy mill I went to, the guy was bringing the dogs out, and there's so many dogs inside the puppy mill that when the dogs started barking, when he went in to get the dogs, the side of the barn was actually shaking. There's no enforcement. They, they supposedly this year and last year in pe both Pennsylvania and Ohio made the laws better, but yeah, they, they passed the laws, but no one's enforcing them. See, a lot of people think when you say we rescue dogs from puppy mills, they think we went and kicked the barn down and take the dogs. But that's, that's not what we did because the, because mills are legal. And I think a lot of people don't understand that, you know, these puppy mills are legal. They're allowed. So I explained to them how, you know, we, we wait for the Amish to contact, you know, then we set up a day when we can go get the dogs. And then, you know, we'll load up the cars, you know, and then we'll drive, you know, meet them, you know, go to their property, get the dogs. Like I said, all the gold at and all they want is love. <laughs> it's amazing. You're okay, yeah, you're cool. Huh? Yeah, my name is Eugene D. Pasquale, and I'm the Pennsylvania Auditor General.
We make sure all money is spent legally and effectively, but we also audit state programs. So it's not just a question of whether the financial side of it is, the you know, the the account ledgers are matching up, but also what is the effectiveness of the program? So we get to go in and say, okay, the money might have been spent legally, but was it spent effectively? Was the program run effectively? While inspections and prosecutions dramatically increased after the Pennsylvania dog law came into force, within a few years, noticeable concerns began to emerge. I started to receive reports confidentially from within the department, reaching out to me, dog wardens, administrators, um, people who had worked for the department and had left, veterinarians who were concerned that the new head of the Office of Dog Law had no idea what she was doing. So reviewing inspection reports in, in 2011 um, indicates that there were virtually no citations issued. Just like any other law, it's only as good as the enforcement of it. And early on in, in the law, there were some concerns that it wasn't being enforced properly. So hence the audit of the dog law program began. In a scathing report, Auditor General De Pasquale found the dog law program from its introduction in 2008 through 2012 showed an intentional lack of enforcement of the state's dog law and the commercial kennel canine health regulations. We weren't enforcing the law on the kennel, meaning the Department of Agriculture said this in, during the audit, that they weren't enforcing it because they knew the kennels weren't complying. And, and to say that again, they weren't enforcing it because they knew the kennels weren't complying. But the goal of the law is to get people not to do it. The goal of the dog law was not to find kennels. It was to get kennels to improve the conditions in their facilities for for the animals. That's the goal of the program. We were getting the troops ready to really make a huge deal out of the lack of enforcement of this very popular law. And all of a sudden, it was a 180 in the department. And they hired a director of enforcement who was one of the best dog wardens that we've ever seen. But here is the, the big, big issue. And it's not just this, it's anything we do. The people matter who are running the programs. And right now, I think the administration made significant strides into who is running the program. But the people that are actually running the program, sometimes you know, they, they're faceless bureaucrats to the general public, and I understand that. But the actual individual who's in charge matters. And it's important that governors, whether they be Democratic or Republican, they, they not just put people in because of political considerations, but also the qualifications of the individual. But I do think that that is the case now that you have top-notch professional there, and that, I think, is a big reason why you're starting to see a turnaround in the program. While progress has been made, the challenges of regulating and inspecting licensed commercial breeders and finding unlicensed breeders in Pennsylvania continues. In the heart of Lancaster County, Millwood Kennel, aka Millwood Puppies, provides a prime example of the bureaucratic shell game played by some large-scale breeders. David and Naomi Stolzfus had been breeding dogs on their property in Lancaster County since the early 1990s, having obtained both a Pennsylvania license and a USDA commercial breeder's license. From 2003 onward, Pennsylvania inspection reports clearly indicate dogs were suffering in a facility that was not meeting even minimal welfare standards. After a further string of horrendous inspection reports in 2008, David Stolzfus voluntarily relinquished both his Pennsylvania and USDA license, but the dogs remained at the same puppy mill, though the name was changed to Millwood Puppies, and ownership passed to David's son, Matthew Stolzfus. Matthew quickly obtained a USDA commercial breeder's license at the same address. Immediately, the violations continued under the new license. When Millwood Puppies was inspected in October 2009, the violations were so severe that the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania brought multiple charges against Matthew for violations under the dog law. Before Pennsylvania District Judge Isaac Stolzfus, all charges against Matthew were summarily withdrawn and all cases closed in 2010. At no time were the dogs removed from the facility by either state or federal authorities. Around this time, Matthew found a new, very lucrative avenue to sell his puppies, the internet. 
Since 2010, it's estimated that Matthew has sold over 3,000 puppies online, ranging from $300 to $2,800 each. In 2013 alone, Millwood Puppies sold 472 dogs, more than a dog a day. During this period, Matthew maintained a Pennsylvania kennel license, but in January 2014, he applied for a new USDA commercial breeder's license for Millwood Puppies LLC. This was the third USDA commercial breeder's license and the second Pennsylvania license issued for this one address in the past eight years. I think one of the most remarkable things that we actually were able to illustrate on the Oprah show is that one of the dogs that we picked up from Millwood Kennels, uh, we, uh, it was either Millwood Kennels at the time or Millwood Puppies, it was a yellow lab, a male yellow lab, and I'll never forget him, he was a really beautiful dog, but he had never been off wire flooring. It's a beautiful, beautiful yellow lab. And the Amish breeder, Matthew Stolpes, dragged the dog down the hill. We put, picked the dog up and put the dog in the van. When we put the dog down on the solid flooring in the lobby, he started to walk like he had never been, he had never been on solid flooring again, and he started walking up the wall. He tried to walk up the wall of our lobby because he had never been on solid flooring before. And it was just amazing to me that they would expect an animal to live his or her entire life on painful wire flooring, and they wouldn't do it themselves. Matthew's large-scale puppy breeding business was not his only interaction with the USDA. During the same time period, he was receiving farm subsidies from the USDA that totaled $56,624 in commodity subsidies associated with his dairy farm. Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, has a total population of a little over 536,000 residents. From 1995 to 2012, farmers in the county have received $128 million in taxpayer-funded farm subsidies from the USDA. An extensive investigation for this film found numerous examples of USDA licensed commercial breeders receiving multiple violations from the Animal Health Division on one hand and large taxpayer-funded farm subsidies on the other. While the programs are viewed as distinct and separate by the USDA, the fact remains that licensed commercial breeders with multiple dog welfare violations continue to receive taxpayer-funded farm subsidies in Lancaster County and many other rural areas throughout the United States. These commercial breeders are exploiting a federal agency by receiving a taxpayer-funded handout while simultaneously receiving major violations for failing the dogs in their care. AKC, in terms of its revenue model, registers dogs and registers litters. So it's involved in a transactional relationship with those breeders. And obviously the ones producing the most dogs are the largest scale breeders. So why is it going to crack down on those large scale breeders and sacrifice the revenue from a rigorous program that stops people from confining animals, denying them vet care, exposing them to extremes of heat and cold, if they're going to lose revenue. The American Kennel Club prides itself on being the only purebred registry in the United States with an ongoing routine kennel inspection program with a dedicated team of field inspectors. The AKC says that it inspects kennels but they don't make any of those inspection records available. Uh, they say that they've got rigorous standards, but they really don't announce what those standards are in real terms. Uh, they say that they kick people out, but we don't really have a comprehensive record of when they're doing that or what the consequences are. I mean, even if they're kicked out, they can still keep breeding and they can still keep operating. So what's the value of their inspections program? Their enforcement efforts, for all we know, are completely meaningless. We don't know what they even inspect for when they go into these facilities because they don't make their inspection records public. Quite frankly, if they were meaningful inspections, there would be no reason not to make them public. 
While the AKC boasts of a rigorous inspection program, in 2011, only $1.5 million of their $59 million in revenue was spent to employ just nine inspectors across the entire United States. The AKC is a group that, that uh, says it's the dog's champion, uh, but in practical terms is consistently leading the fight against efforts to establish humane dog breeding standards in the states and at the federal level. Over 5,000 kennel inspections last year. The American Kennel Club. We make all this possible because you make us possible. Register your dog with the only U.S. registry that matters. Visit akc.org. And wherever we advance that sort of legislation, not radical, not far-reaching, just basic, fundamental, anything that a pet owner would think is a minimal standard of care, the AKC opposes it. Since 2009, the AKC has opposed over 100 different bills, regulations, or ordinances that protect dogs. In 2012 alone, the AKC opposed a Nebraska state bill that would require commercial breeders to have regular on-site visits by a veterinarian, a Louisiana state bill that would prohibit all dog owners from stacking crates, a Rhode Island state bill that the AKC deemed dangerous that would make it unlawful for dog owners to keep a dog confined in a pen, cage, or other shelter for more than 14 hours, a proposed ordinance in Shelby County, Tennessee that would make it a violation to leave a companion animal unattended in a vehicle for more than one hour when the temperature is above 70 degrees or below 35 degrees. Why is the American Kennel Club, the dog's best friend, opposing this legislation that says that once a year you've got to have a vet examine these dogs or you can't breed them every single heat cycle or you can't have more than 50 breeding females at an operation? Why would a group oppose that? Well, they oppose it because they're making money from those large-scale operations. While the public does not have access to AKC inspection reports, many pet stores across the United States emphasize to their potential customers that their facilities are AKC approved and inspected. One such company is Petland, the largest chain of pet stores selling puppies in the United States. While most pet lands are independently owned and operated, the company's relationship with the AKC is a central focus in nearly every store. It's not unusual to see a dog that's AKC registered in a pet store. The AKC could be targeting this major distribution channel saying, we are not going to endorse pet stores if we see our dogs in those stores because we don't feel that is a good means by which a dog is being raised. Um, and unfortunately, they've not taken that position. Where do you guys get the dogs from? Uh, they all come from certified breeders. So everyone always talks about puppy mills, and honestly, those really don't even exist anymore. Anything that's not AKC certified is basically people don't trust as much. I actually bought my first dog from Petland. In my head, I was saving that dog from the cage only because it was way too big for the small cage it was in. There was poop, and he just looked sick. And I went back to visit and visit and visit. Well, they're just very pushy. If you've ever been in a pet land, they want you to buy the dog no matter what. And, you know, they give you all these options. I would visit the dog. It just started me looking through the cage. And they're like, oh, do you want to go to our puppy playroom? And then they'd give you a toy and you get to play with this dog. And you started falling in love with the dog. And then you're broke. And so they're like, here's a credit card. We will help you pay for the dog. And, you know, he would really love to go home with you. And so they're trying to play on your emotions and on your pocketbook. You're visiting a Petland store with your family and you can't help but fall in love. You've found that perfect pet for your family and now maybe you're asking yourself, where did this puppy come from? Let's take a look at the journey Petland puppies make before arriving at our store. While Petland maintains that it does not purchase from substandard breeders, there's no doubt that the vast majority of puppies sold in their stores come from large scale commercial kennels where the parents of those puppies will spend their whole lives in a cage. 
In 2009, the Humane Society of the United States released an exhaustive investigation into shipments over three months of more than 15,000 puppies across the country. The report determined that 95% of the puppies in Petland stores come from large-scale commercial kennels. I work at a gym right next to a Petland, and I see it all the time. And I even stopped and said, you know, even to a young couple, you know, with kids, hey, uh, before, do me a favor before you go in there, you know, Google puppy mills. Oh, we know what a puppy mill is. I said, well, why are you going in there buying a dog? What kind of, I know rescues that have puppies right now. What are you looking for? A lot of the dogs that are purchased in pet stores, we, uh, we end up with them because the families can't afford their medical care. Uh, they have some uh, birth defect or some chronic problem or uh, worms or parvo or um, anything that, uh, that these animals can pick up in the actual mill and uh, they always seem to be in a weakened state, always. Most of the puppies that are coming from these large-scale factory farming kind of operations are being sold in pet stores. So when you go into a pet store and you see that beautiful little puppy that's jumping out and really wants the attention from you, most people have no idea that the mother and father are back somewhere in a factory farm type of setting where it can be um, horrendous. It's not just Petland franchises that get the vast majority of their inventory from the primary states for puppy mills. Independent pet stores choose to seek out these same states. A stark example of this supply chain leads directly from Holmes County, Ohio, to a single pet store in Patterson, New Jersey, D&G Petite Pups. Inspection reports obtained by Ohio voters for companion animals show that in 2012, over 300 puppies from puppy mills in Holmes County were sold wholesale to D&G. Only one reason would seemingly compel the owner of D&G to seek out breeders located over seven hours away. The price. If a breeder is simply selling to a pet shop, that's not about placing that animal with a family for the rest of their life. That's really about the money. Pet store puppies are puppy mill puppies because a reputable breeder, somebody who cares about their animals, wants to know where they're going. Any breeder that is in it for the love of dogs and they, they love what they're doing and they're a good breeder, they're going to have as many questions for you as you have for them. No good reputable breeder will sell a dog on the internet or sell a dog to a broker to sell to a pet store. It's not going to happen. A good breeder will want to know who you are. You always have to go and see the parents of the dog uh, that you're purchasing. Um, if a breeder does not want you to see the conditions that the parents are living in, you're almost guaranteed that it's a puppy mill. This is largely a marketing uh, sort of enterprise where people can register the litters, the puppies, and you get the halo effect that this is an AKC registered dog or litter, when in reality it has no practical meaning when it comes to animal welfare. AKC papers mean absolutely nothing. You know, and when you come, push comes to shove, AKC, when they're backed into a corner, will admit it has nothing to do with humaneness or the quality of the dog. It only means who the mother and the father is. They're in favor of breeding dogs. And the more dogs that are bred, the more money they make if those dogs are registered with the AKC. For years and years and years, in fact, even to this day, registration income from registration fees on puppies are subsidizing the dog shows that the AKC puts on. Because the registration fees for dog shows don't meet the amount of money or the expenses of putting them on. So. Historically, they have always subsidized their dog shows through registry fees. So this is why they're going out seeking that puppy mill money. And that's what I always say, when people go into the Westminster Dog Club show, go in there knowing that this show is being subsidized by the cruelty of puppy mills because the AKC will not stop papering dogs from commercial dog breeders. And they oppose legislation when you go to improve the standards of care. By 2010, Missouri had an estimated 3,000 commercial dog breeders and was the largest supplier of puppies to pet stores across the country. The nearly 1,600 breeders with a USDA license was more than the next three states combined. 
In the hopes of improving the lives of dogs living in Missouri puppy mills, national and state animal welfare organizations focused on a ballot initiative that would later become known as Proposition B. Over 190,000 signatures from Missouri residents were collected, and the measure made it to the ballot in the 2010 election. Prop B was something that was in the works for many years because Missouri is the puppy mill capital of the United States. Prop B simply sought to impose humane breeding standards and limits on the size of the puppy mills. You know, when I started out campaigning for Prop B, I had all this different literature and pictures of puppy mills and things like that. After two weeks, I just forgot all that literature. All I brought with me was the copy of Prop B because it wasn't that people wanted to support puppy mills or cruelty to dogs, it was just this hysteria that it affected other things. It was a campaign of fear and misinformation. Fear that Prop B was going to mysteriously morph into a ban on all rearing of animals in agriculture. You know, they said that this would affect farm animals, you know, and, and then of course when they were confronted on it and you'd show them the law, then they'd say, well, it's a slippery slope but they would still continue to go into rural areas and convince everybody that this was going to shut down the family farm. And it just created mass hysteria and it made a really difficult campaign. It didn't deal with cattle, it didn't deal with pigs, it didn't deal with chickens, it didn't deal with any other species. The language was explicit and anyone who's a first year law student could say with definitive precision that it just applied to dogs. It's basically a way to um, one of the dominoes and what I call the line of dominoes out here uh, in eliminating all of domesticated animals, uh, you know, dogs, cats, uh, then you go into the livestock arena, uh, horses and so forth. And in a ballot measure campaign, you don't necessarily need to convince people that your position is right. You just need to sow enough confusion so that people maintain the status quo and vote no. So there's no way to defend puppy mills. So instead, they want to change the subject to all these other animals that people will respond to in an emotional way. This isn't really about puppies. This is about your chicken and your beef and your pork, and this group wants to take those off your dinner plate, right? It's about emotional uh, triggers that they're gonna, the, they're gonna press those buttons to get people to respond emotionally. Well, it's basically a form of lying. I mean, let's just cut to the chase, right? This proposition was about dogs, but industry wants you to think it's about all these other animals because that'll scare the hell out of you. Really, it's an issue for anyone that likes to eat meat protein in their diet. All right, Kelly, thank you very much. Thank you. Kelly Smith, Marketing and Commodities Director for Missouri Farm Bureau. Much more to come on this and other issues as we broadcast from the Missouri Farm Bureau's offices here in Jefferson City, Missouri. Stay with us. It's halftime on Agritalk. Interestingly, my wife and I had made a plan before we settled. We put on a piece of paper what our dream of a farm was. And um, after a long search, I was showed this farm. And it matched exactly what we had written down. So that's why we're here. We lived our life here pretty much, you know, happily. Um, with our, we raised our family, we raised our kids. We felt very comfortable here. Um, we didn't feel threatened at all, you know, and I mean, I would have never at that time suggested to you that clean air was a vital, important thing in my life. They were going to raise hogs, okay? And at the time, I did not know how many hogs they were going to raise. Okay. And it turned out that now they raise 80,000 hogs uh, three miles north of my house. The farmland foods facility in Milan, Missouri, is owned by Smithfield Foods, the largest hog and pork processor in the world, with revenues exceeding $13 billion in 2013. The operation north of me is called Green Hills. There isn't a single pig in there that ever sees the Green Hills. There isn't a single pig down there that ever sees the valley. Okay, so these are wonderful names, but in this are these factory buildings where these hogs are housed in these big barns with little fresh air, with no sunlight, with little movement, with no grass, no nothing. You hear the name Valley View and you think, oh, little piggy running on green grass, you know, just kind of smooching out there, laying in the sun. You don't see that there. 
these are feeder pigs and the amounts of waste are just incredible. And you sit in your backyard with your family and you eat dinner or you sit outside on a warm summer night and all of a sudden the stink rolls in and I would call it a trespass. It just trespasses on your property. It, en it engulfs you and it's there. And I mean, it's just like, it's just like a, a visitor coming that you have not invited. Rolf's relationship with the Missouri Farm Bureau radically changed when he began to complain about the daily waste and odors emitting from Smithfield Foods Factory Farm. While he assumed the Farm Bureau would support a local independent farmer against his new corporate neighbor, Rolf was left to fight alone. I felt abandoned and I also felt that I was working for the wrong organization for, for so many years because all of a sudden this operation, this organization backed down and it supposedly is a farm organization. They supposedly supports individual independent farmers and all of a sudden they were siding with industry and they're siding with industry to this very day. The campaign against Prop B began immediately after it was approved for the ballot at a gathering of the most powerful agricultural forces in Missouri at the Stinson, Morrison and Hecker law firm. In addition to members of the dog breeding industry, the meeting included the leadership of the Missouri Farm Bureau, the Missouri Pork Producers Association and the Missouri Soybean Association. At this meeting, these groups agreed to fight Prop B in a coordinated effort with the dog breeding industry. Two front groups emerged from the meeting, one which would eventually be called Missouri Farmers Care and the Alliance for Truth. While these front groups seemed to have sprung out of thin air, it was actually a highly coordinated effort financed largely by corporate agriculture. Nearly 82% of total contributions to Missouri Farmers Care originated from three corporate agriculture trade groups and their respective political action committees. The Missouri Farm Bureau, the Missouri Pork Producers, and the Missouri Soybean Association. While the Missouri Farmers Care campaign highlighted the positive role of Missouri farmers in society, the Alliance for Truth was focused on misrepresenting the clear language in Prop B. The majority of the funding for the Alliance for Truth was funneled through Missouri Farmers Care by the same agricultural trade groups. The trade groups involved represent the interests of their member corporations. In Missouri, these corporations include some of the largest agribusinesses in the United States, Monsanto, Tyson, Cargill, and Smithfield Foods. While these trade groups used their vast financial resources opposing Prop B, the corporations that ultimately provided the majority of the funding for the campaign remained silent. Simply put, without the financial support of corporate agriculture, the puppy mills of Missouri would not have had the ability to mount the Alliance for Truth or Missouri Farmers Care, which were largely responsible for the opposition to Proposition B. Alliance for Truth, that could be for anything, you know, but they can't call themselves, you know, front group in favor of herding dogs, right? So they have to come up with some other word to just totally distract you from the issue at hand. It's not about the dogs. It's about liberalism, growth of government, intrusion into your life. Missouri has a proud tradition of dog breeding for hunting, home companionship, and just best friends. Enforce existing law against animal abuse, but vote no to the big government liberalism of Proposition B. Paid for by Alliance for Truth. Mark Patterson, Treasurer. I mean, they wouldn't be funding it if the goals weren't the same. I mean, the Alliance for Truth is literally just a front. So there has been a tremendous amount, a shocking amount, of organized opposition to efforts to increase the standards of care for dogs bred in commercial breeding facilities. And most of that opposition, quite frankly, is coming from huge agricultural groups and industries. These are groups that have nothing to do with dogs. All you have to do is look at who's funding these front groups to see who's really benefiting from them. It's not the individual farmers and ranchers who, you know, may believe in some of the uh, messaging that these groups are putting forward, but it's really the major players in big agribusiness who are benefiting. And it's the industry-wide defense that's going on. It's not to protect the, far the poor rancher. I mean, those guys are getting screwed. I have distinct interests in the future of this farm and the future of this community. 
a corporation, their interest is making money. Their interest is not in the community. Their interest is not what is being left behind. Community interest is zero. Prop B was very specific. It was a bill that addressed commercial breeding of dogs. Not chickens, not cows, not pigs. But that's what the opposition said. That's the misinformation that they gave to people in the state of Missouri to scare people. It was purely fear tactics on their part. And it really ended up being at the expense of the thousands of dogs that suffer on a daily basis in the state of Missouri. Every signature that put Prop B on the ballot was signed by a Missouri resident. Every vote that passed Prop B into law was passed by a Missouri resident. Missourians cared, and, and this was not an out-of-state, you know, they keep saying, oh, it was out-of-state interest, that, you know, they might have provided the money so we could get the word out, but they didn't go to the polls, obviously. It was Missouri residents who voted for this. The reporting 96.8% uh, in, and what we know is out there, we are officially declaring victory. <laughs> We won by 51 and a half percent. It became very close, unfortunately, because of this mass hysteria that was just being spread in the rural areas. I mean, they really did, people really believe it. I mean, I talked to them one-on-one, -on -one. They, they really believe this was gonna close down the farms. Good evening, thank you for joining us. All eyes are on Missouri Governor Jay Nixon. Will he sign a bill changing Proposition B, even though voters already approved it? Prop B stirred the emotions of Missourians on both sides of the issue, but it was ultimately approved by 51% of voters. The thought of altering it is outraging the law's supporters. Essentially, um, a couple of hundred lawmakers have substituted their judgment for the judgment of about a million voters. Nancy Weller says she can't bear to see another dog pulled out of a puppy mill. She and more than a million other Missouri voters pushed for Prop B, the very bill lawmakers are now working to change. The ink wasn't dry on the formalizing of the final election results when state lawmakers in Missouri said we're going to repeal Prop B. Several of them advanced bills to re repeal Prop B in its entirety immediately after the vote of the people. You know, we're not out to put these people out of business per se. We just want them to comply with good standards of care. But instead they went in and repealed the whole thing. They threw it all out. It, it was just ridiculous. Five months after Missouri voters approved a tough new puppy mill law, the law is changing. They even changed the name of the law from the Puppy Mill Cruelty Act to the Canine Cruelty Prevention Act. And it does remove the 50 breeding dog limit and some requirements for the living conditions of animals. It is a constitutional process, and when citizens decide they can do that, the legislature should defer to the will of the people. How, how do you run a government when the voters go to the polls, they vote on something, and then it's just ignored? There was an election. That's the way things run. And I had to think, what is best for these animals? You know, can we swallow our pride and sit down and work out something? Or I'm going to take the high road and, and say, no, no, we're not taking anything. We want it all or nothing. No, you have to do what's best for the animals. That's why I got into this, you know? And there are a lot of lawmakers in the state of Missouri that we know receive huge financial contributions from agricultural industry groups. Those are the groups that oppose Proposition B, and there is no doubt in our minds that those same groups pressured lawmakers to overturn Proposition B. And before the session even started, there were bills that were pre-filed to do just that. Welcome to Your Vote Counts, Missouri edition. Well, that is unless the corporate agriculture disagrees with the voters, then it doesn't really count. It needs to be changed because they clearly didn't understand what they were voting for. And honestly, corporate agriculture is there, ready to help and tell the Missouri legislature what is best for the voters. On tonight's edition of Your Vote Counts, we bring back some of our past big winners, trade groups, the Missouri Pork Producers Association, Missouri Soybean Association, Missouri Farm Bureau, and one of our audience's all-time favorites, Smithfield Foods. These folks have been working hard to protect Missourians from themselves by rewarding their friends in the Missouri Senate for repealing the annoying, clearly unnecessary provisions in Prop B. 
Tonight, we welcome you to the Missouri Senate floor. The 20 good folks in blue voted to strip the annoying provisions from Prop B and those 14 in red. Well, that might not have been the best decision. Let's look at the breakdown and see who has been rewarded in campaign cash since that faithful vote that day through 2013. Show me Missouri Soybean Association. Show me Missouri Farm Bureau. Show me Missouri Pork Producers Association. And last but not least, show me Smithfield Foods. Well, folks, it's pretty clear that voting with corporate agriculture results in cold, hard campaign cash. While Prop B would have had no impact on their businesses, they rewarded their friends in the Missouri Senate with over $147,000. Those senators willing to respect the will of the people, a paltry $18,500 since the vote. Thanks to a generous offer from Smithfield Foods, as a consolation prize after the election of 2010, all 34 senators were offered Christmas hams. Thanks for playing. Your vote counts. You feel bad because Prop B was repealed, but you know, all of your work, all of your effort paid off because it's made a dramatic difference for these dogs. I mean, just the fact that over almost half of these facilities are out of business, who could have envisioned that? Things are definitely much improved with many of the worst operations eliminated, but you still have chronic violators um, who are operating. You still have inhumane treatment of the animals, and you still have this defiant attitude that, that um, some folks believe they can do whatever they want. There are so many issues out here, so many important issues, and everybody is struggling in their own way that we don't necessarily want to pick up the other guy's struggle. Eventually, I have to go back into my town and face this neighbor and face the other neighbors. And I will meet them at church, I'll meet them at the grocery store, I'll meet them at the restaurant, at the sale barn, and I'm responsible. I am responsible. And I think this is where the buck ends. We individually have to take responsibility as producers, and also as consumers. But I mean, I think for the public, very clearly, you know, you have a choice in the product that you buy at the store. When you hear of a problem in your own backyard, if you're like me, you're going to try to fix it. I felt more like a hypocrite where you can't defend the rights of all dogs if you're going to ignore the problem down the street. At first it was I wanted to educate people who had no idea, like I didn't know. And so I knew that if, if somehow I was educated by one story, then other people would be. The protest started Black Friday of 2011, and the reason we did that is because that's when people start buying Christmas puppies, start placing orders for Christmas puppies, and we wanted that to stop. So when they first started, we were there open to close every single Saturday. That was a very, very long and cold winter. We always protest peacefully. We always hold our signs, our, we always have our backup. I keep a folder with all of the information. I have handouts for people that are very factual and we don't tell any lies. That's the biggest thing. A few friends and I started going around to the mills in Iowa and experiencing it firsthand. So our local store is Divig's Pet Shop, and we went in there and we saw the puppies and asked them, and at first they were like, from a breeder in Grundy Center. They were very open about it, and so we asked if we could contact them, and so they gave us their card, and we made an appointment, and we went, and we visited the mill, and it was, it was awful. Well, in Iowa in general, we have the negative temperatures and the very, very hot temperatures, and the dogs are forced to live in that 24-7, and so our protests are every single weekend, no matter what the weather. Today, we are very thankful to be in positive temperatures. Uh, when I left my house this morning with the wind chill, it was negative 14. This is cold. It's not one of our coldest. It is average winter Iowa weather. 
Usually our protests are between two people and 10 people. It really just depends on the weather and what we all have going on. It is a priority to everybody. Um, we have several people that travel from out of town to get here. Two years is a long time to think that we've been in front of here. This is where we hang out. <laughs> Young people hang out in front of pet stores on Saturdays. <laughs> We only have to be out here for two hours, and then the dogs that are in puppy mills have to be out here all the time. The dogs in the shelters need your home more than the breeders need your money. I definitely think that it's going to be drastically different in five to ten years, and I think it's going to continue to change as people become more aware of what, what a puppy mill means and what these dogs in the store actually come from and endure. I like to say that it's a ripple effect. If I educate one person, who knows how many other people they will tell. And so if we can all educate our little corner of the earth, then someday we will not have these problems because once the public really knows what's going on, they will not support it. No matter how upset I am, I know the dogs have it a thousand times worse. And so I never even consider giving up. It's never been an option. I will use my voice because they don't have one. And I will keep doing it until there are no more puppy mill dogs. Until recent changes, the only federal regulations governing commercial dog breeding date back to the passing of the Animal Welfare Act, or AWA, in 1966. The AWA defined a commercial dog breeder as one who maintains four or more breeding female dogs and sells the offspring into wholesale channels. Any breeder or retail pet store engaged in the direct sale of dogs to the public was exempt from the AWA. Let me clarify that a little bit. Uh, the Animal Welfare Act only requires that we do annual inspections on research facilities. So there's no requirement for the other entities that we regulate. Uh, but every facility that's either licensed or registered with us is assigned a minimum inspection frequency. We have a risk-based inspection system. So based on the risk of finding noncompliance, risk of animal welfare, welfare concerns, a facility may be assigned a frequency of, of once a year, uh, twice a year, three times a year, whatever that system assigns to it. The AWA does not require yearly vet checkups, access to exercise, socialization, or protections against extreme heat or cold, and allows both wire flooring and stackable cages. Well, the Animal Welfare Act is passed and it requires humane standards of care for dogs raised in commercial breeding establishments and it requires that the Department of Agriculture go out and inspect these facilities and make sure that they're complying with these regulations. I always refer to the regulations that we have today with the USDA as survival standards. If you comply with these standards of care, the dogs will probably live. But is it humane? No. Right now in the USDA regulations, a dog only requires six inches of living space bigger than the dog itself. And you're talking about a dog that's living in that space for its entire life. And the Department of Agriculture really is there to promote American agriculture. It's not an impartial sort of entity uh, that is neutrally overseeing the laws. And for years, USDA was allied with the very interests that it was supposed to regulate, including these folks within the agriculture sector who you know, started raising puppies and started operating puppy mills. Never in the state of Ohio has any breeder been forced out of business because of repeat long-standing violations of the Animal Welfare Act. If they choose to no longer be USDA licensed, it's because they chose not to renew their license, not because inspectors came in. Um, to actually revoke that license. I never heard of an, a regulator coming to Pennsylvania. No one was getting shut down. The feeling of the industry was very, we don't have to worry about it. So frankly, their doors were pretty open. So often, if a breeder's in violation of the Animal Welfare Act, they get a slap on the hands. And when they get the slap on the hands, most often it is months following the violation. And they're given an opportunity to correct the violation. And sometimes it may be days or months before that inspector returns to ensure that that violation has been corrected. Um, it's very rare that they will be given a fine that 
is truly impactful to their bottom line, so they factor it in as a cost of doing business. The enforcement of the Animal Welfare Act has been horrendous, and, um, and for many, many years, in fact, just um, 2010, their own Office of Inspector General issued a very damning report on how terrible their inspections were. In fact, they documented inspectors walking by dying dogs and just leaving them there, you know, not, not writing up these people and putting them out of business. It's been really, really bad. The Inspector General found several major problems with enforcement of the AWA, including finding a massive loophole that allowed breeders to sell puppies over the internet without a license, and delaying confiscation of suffering animals to give violators a final opportunity to take corrective action before confiscation can occur, even in extreme cases where animals are dying. It's called the Animal Welfare Act. You know, it's not the, the Kennel Building Welfare Act, it's the animals. And yet, even some of the good inspectors, were, they were acting as building inspectors. They would make sure that the building was clean and they had good shelter from the extreme temperatures, but the dogs would be sick or dying. The fo a lot of the focus of that uh, was on inconsistency in some of the things our inspectors were citing and the length of time it took to get to enforcement. So we put uh, some in intensified training in place for our inspectors, some different oversight uh, of our inspection process and worked with our enforcement branch uh, to find different ways to expedite the enforcement process. Uh, since then we've also uh, worked on some non-traditional or non-regulatory solutions. If we can help somebody come into compliance without having to resort to enforcement action and get those animals in a better welfare situation quicker, that's what we're gonna do. Since being elected in 1997, Senator Dick Durbin has introduced legislation in every session that would dramatically improve the lives of dogs in commercial kennels and would close the internet loophole. The way people sold dogs changed. And as it changed, it was no longer going to the individual breeder, no longer just going to the store. Now it was online sales. And they were exempt from the kind of regular inspection that would protect the puppies and their mothers. So we had to make sure that our bill really filled this gap and provided the protection for those online sales uh, and the pups that were part of it. Even in the midst of the hyperpartisanship of the U.S. Senate, on the issue of puppy mills, Senator Durbin found willing partners on the Republican side of the aisle. My first co-sponsor was Rick Santorum, one of the most conservative Republicans from Pennsylvania. He was on this bill with me, and then after he left the Senate, uh, I had Senator Vitter from Louisiana, another very conservative senator. So it turns out that when it comes to humane treatment of animals, and dogs in particular, this is very bipartisan. If a bill like PUPS went to the floor of the House or the Senate, it would be an overwhelming uh, yay vote for the measure. It would be 90, 95 yes votes in the Senate, and it would be 400 or so yes votes in the House out of 435. The problem is on animal welfare legislation in the Congress is that many of the bills get tracked to the House and Senate committees on agriculture. And those committees are populated by the most rural lawmakers aligned with the biggest agribusiness interests in the United States. Throughout the years, members of the Senate Agriculture Committee have received enormous campaign contributions from agriculture giants, including Monsanto, Tyson, Smithfield, and Cargill. Besides these direct contributions, each of these corporations spent millions of dollars each year lobbying Congress. Seemingly afraid of how a theoretical slippery slope protecting dogs and puppy mills could hurt their operations, corporate agriculture sided with commercial breeders. They get uh, loads of campaign cash from these agribusiness groups because that's the funnel for the legislation that these agribusiness groups want. Who doesn't want to protect dogs? And yet somehow industry finds a way to twist that around and make you scared into voting against those common sense, positive public policies. They typically oppose any animal welfare legislation because they think they're going to be next. And they think that if you have a society that is incrementally building animal welfare standards, it's eventually going to lead society to examine their conduct. Even with strong public support for common sense changes to the Animal Welfare Act, 
none of these bills were allowed out of committee. Recognizing the original intentions of the AWA and the advent of commercial breeders selling exclusively over the internet, the USDA moved on their own to update the regulations. So the administration, seeing the enormous number of senators and U.S. representatives backing that legislation and getting hundreds of thousands of comments from HSUS members and other animal welfare advocates, they finally uh, passed a rule to bring these Internet sellers under the regulatory authority of USDA. Before the change in regulations, nearly 7,500 facilities across the United States were subject to inspection. Besides commercial breeding facilities, this includes research facilities, zoos, circuses, marine parks, transport vehicles, television and film productions involving animals, state fairs, camel rides, petting zoos, elephant rides, and traveling and or roadside zoos. In 2013, 115 USDA inspectors conducted between 10 and 11,000 inspections on these various facilities. Approximately 3,000 of those inspections were conducted on commercial dog breeding facilities. Since this change in policy will now also require commercial breeders selling on the internet to obtain a license, the USDA estimates that there will be up to 4,600 additional new facilities under their inspection umbrella. Based on their own projections, a total of between 10 and 12,000 facilities will now fall under the inspection provisions of the Animal Welfare Act. This change will increase the workload of their 115 inspectors by nearly a third. The USDA has no plans to add additional inspectors. I think since the rule came into effect, um, the number one way that we've gotten uh, contacts or people's names is people self-reporting. We do, we have looked at breeder registries uh, to get ID, to get numbers. We watch the internet, I look at uh, marketing, promotional things from folks that uh, sell over the internet. So this is a good move for um, dogs that it's now part of the Animal Welfare Act, but again, our question is going to be, how are you going to enforce it? because you're having a very difficult time enforcing the law that was already in place. And now we've just added a new dimension to it. We've got 115 people uh, stationed across the country to do our inspections. Uh, their workload is prioritized by a risk-based system, so we get them uh, to those places where they're most needed. And at this point in time, we do feel like we have uh, resources to be successful at doing this. You know, I worry about that. We're at a time where we're cutting back on spending and appropriations in every direction. Uh, and they say they have enough to get started, but I'm going to keep an eye on it. I have even documented USDA inspectors who had their own puppy mill themselves. I documented supervisors of inspectors who were out working as roofers during the day when they were supposed to be out checking on their inspectors. I mean, the enforcement was absolutely atrocious and has been since the inception of the act. And it was just recently, in the last couple of years, that USDA has really turned around and started to enforce the law that's been on the books since 1970. We're seeing a closing of this loophole that allowed Internet sellers. Um, and we just have to continue now uh, with our efforts to educate the public that the best place to get uh, animals is a shelter or a rescue group or a responsible breeder uh, who is really treating the mother dog uh, like a pet and not a breeding machine. They usually have a number, so he actually has a tattoo on his ear because he was auctioned, he, and that might number. have been his num That might have been his name. Once we got him, he was shaking a lot because he didn't know what to do. He was trapped in this tiny little wired cage. If we go near the crate with him, he will just start freaking out, and he won't let us bring him anywhere near it. Puppy mill, puppy mill, Pennsylvania SPCA, the little one, the little Pomeranian's a puppy mill. This dog is Pennsylvania SPCA. And then the little dog out there is puppy mill as well. 
It's a nice face. He's really, really cute. He's, uh, he's really cute. He came in with a fractured skull. And these two in here came from a hoarding situation in Philadelphia. We took in 39 little blue chihuahua dachshund mixes. was probably about nine months old, eight, nine months old. And the dog was so full of joy and just wanted to get out and run around. And the dog was down on its elbows and it was playing and, and it was in a rabbit hutch standing on wire, but it desperately wanted to get out. And I, can we take this dog? No, I just got the dog, we're breeding the dog. I'm just starting to breed her. So this was years ago. And then every time we went back, I would see this dog and the dog was getting older and older and he didn't want her anymore because she wasn't a good breeder. And I was looking at her and her eyes were dead and Within, I would say about a month, we, she started to come around and I could see the dog that I remembered from before. But it's a shame that she had to go through all that. You know, her entire life just consisted of this misery. It's nice watching the first time they ever walked on a leash, the first time, you know, they come up to you and they give you a kiss or they, you know, they come to your side. If it wasn't for us, them dogs don't have a chance. We're their second chance at a normal life. Because if, if I mean, if we didn't go get the dogs, they would just kill them. And that's it. And that's all. We don't necessarily know the background, but so often those dogs, um, really, you just give them time and you give them um, some good instruction and they turn out to be fabulous dogs. We've had shelter dogs, we've had shell, um, dogs from the pounds, we've taken dogs from puppy mills. If you give them good care and a lot of love, they can always turn around. He wouldn't want to be held and now he loves being held. <laughs> Forever, once you pick him up. It's, it's just a beautiful transformation. It, it is the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my life. I think these dogs come to us and physically on the outside, they look like hopeless cases. But there is just a morsel of their spirit within them that we take and we nurture it and it starts to blossom. One of the things that never ceases to amaze me about puppy mill dogs is no matter how horribly they've been treated by humans, all they want is to be near humans. They'll live in the house, they'll have yard space. They might not even be in the, in the crate at all. They could sleep on the bed with their parents. They could just live a normal dog's life. I'm hopeful because I think we have a generation um, coming up after me who are becoming much more enlightened because of social media and access to the internet, that we have information at our fingertips now, that they're able to educate themselves on what are puppy mills? What keeps them in business? One person can get a lot done, but it doesn't really, nothing really changes until you inspire other people and get other people involved. That it's really important that people, if they see something going on, especially any kind of injustice, they should bring it to people's attention. You know, people have to know what's going on out there. And um, they just do, otherwise change is not possible. So I started learning about how Iowa's laws are horrible when it comes to protecting our companion animals. And so I started our blog, Bailing Out Benji, and I, I just started writing because I thought if I didn't know, and I thought that I was a pretty educated person, especially when it came to animals, that other people didn't know. And so I tried to make it relatable. We actually started a club, and its name is Woof, Welfare of Our Friends. And we actually made custom wristbands for every, everyone in the club. It says, adopt, don't shop, with our school colors on them. Don't support the puppy mills, and they'll go out of business. So just one person at a time, I mean, everybody counts. The work that they're doing on getting the word out, um, especially to the young people who are the ones asking for those pets and making sure that they know what a puppy mill is. So since uh, we initially got to know them, they've come out to events. Uh, I've been out to speak at their school. They, I organized a day. I got to speak to their entire school about puppy mills. So they're, they're just incredible. You know, we need people to start realizing 
But these puppy mills exist. These puppies in pet stores come from puppy mills. Whether you believe it or not, that's where your dog came from, a puppy mill. The thing that needs to be across to them is they're not rescuing or saving a puppy by, by buying that dog. What they're doing is they're sentencing the mother of that dog to a lifetime of misery in a puppy mill. If the general public doesn't stop buying puppies, it's not going to change. It's, it's just, it's not going to stop. I'll be doing this till the day I die. And I hope not. I hope, I hope I don't have to spend my days, you know, going to save dogs. We Americans are treating dogs like members of the family. We allow them into our beds to sleep at night. We spend, you know, money on them. We give them life-saving veterinary care. A society that values dogs is not a society that's going to tolerate this abuse of dogs on puppy mills. Until the public is willing to forego the purchase of a puppy on the internet or in pet stores, no regulation will end the suffering of thousands of breeding dogs trapped in commercial mills. Across the United States at humane societies, rescues and pounds, millions of dogs are awaiting the chance to join a family. If the general public decides to adopt and not shop, the factory farming of puppies would end. The power really does lie in the people. What we have as a movement is a million households who care about animals and who are willing to pick up the phone. And being able to tap that power, that is what should make any puppy miller terrified. The other side has a much more difficult task. They've got to convince people that keeping dogs in confinement for their entire lives, denying them vet care, exposing them to extremes of heat and cold is an acceptable way to treat dogs. These are elected officials and they work for us and we're going to make sure they work for us. Um, we know we're up against a lot of corruption and consumer fraud and animal cruelty, but I think it's every time you educate that one person, that could be the next person who makes a difference at the state house or at the local level or even at the federal level. So that's what keeps me going. Um, I do think that it's really important that people, if they see something going on, especially any kind of injustice, they should bring it to people's attention. You know, people have to know what's going on out there, and um, they just do, otherwise change is not possible. 20 years from now, we'd all like to look back, and we know it's going to happen. We're going to look back and we're going to say, thank God we don't have puppy mills anymore. I can't believe the way we allowed people to treat these dogs. <laughs>